Hello, my name is Andrew Ahn Westover, and I'm the key pairing director of education and public engagement at the New Museum. I join you today from the unceded land of Lenape people, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying respect to Lenape people and elders and ancestors, past, present, and future. On behalf of the New Museum, I am glad to welcome you to today's conversation between Tiana Nakia McLaughlin and Margot Norton. This program series includes over a dozen artist conversations presented in conjunction with our current exhibition, Grief and Grievance, Art and Mourning in America. Programs like this are core to the new museum's work of advancing new art and new ideas. I would particularly like to thank Education and Public Engagement staff members, Andrea Calderes and Derek Wright, as well as the entire New Museum team for their help bringing this program together. New Museum digital initiatives are generously supported by Hermione and David B. Heller. We also thank our members and supporters like you who help make programs like this possible. I'll now share brief biographical details about this program's featured artist. Tiana Nakia McLaughlin is a visual artist filmmaker and curator whose interdisciplinary practice builds from intersections of race, gender, sexuality, and spiritual practice. Working in diverse media, including documentary film, experimental video, sculpture, and sound installation, McLaughlin's work critiques and expands understandings of time, memory, and intersubjectivities within Black communities. McLaughlin has exhibited and screened work at the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York, Haus der Kultur in der Welt in Berlin, Institute of Contemporary Art Philadelphia, Museum of Contemporary Art Los Angeles, Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, and MoMA PS1 in New York. Her films were included in the Kansai Queer Film Festival in Osaka and Kyoto, and the London Lesbian and Gay Film Festival, among a range of international film festivals and film programs. She is the recipient of the Buxbaum Award for her work in the 2019 Whitney Biennial, a Guggenheim Fellowship in Fine Arts, an Arts Matter Foundation grant, a Magnum Foundation Fund, a Keith Herring Fellowship in Art and Activism from Bard College, the 2017 Lewis Comfort Timpani Foundation Award, and a Pew Fellowship, among others. Her writing has been featured in Triple Canopy, Art Forum, Cultured Magazine, Art 21 Magazine, and many other publications. Currently, Tiona lives and works in North Philadelphia, Pennsylvania and is the founder and owner of Conceptual Fade, a Philadelphia-based micro-gallery and library space centering Black thought and artistic production. And now a few logistical notes before we begin. This program will last for approximately one hour. If you would like to ask a question, please feel free to use the Q&A function at any time by clicking the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. Please note that this program is being recorded, so your question will be recorded as well. If there is time, our speakers will answer questions during the Q&A at the end of the program. Finally, I encourage you to learn more about upcoming public programs and our full suite of exclusive digital content on our website, newmuseum.org. Now, without further ado, I turn the conversation over to the New Museum's Alan and Lola Goldring curator, Margot Norton. Thank you so much, Andrew. I'm so honored to be here today with Tiana Nakia McLaughlin uh, to speak about her work, which is included in our Grief and Grievance exhibition at New Museum, uh, which is on view through June 6th, and is an exhibition originally conceived by the late legendary curator Okwe and Weser, and overseen by a team of advisors, including Naomi Beckwith, Glenn Ligon, Mark Nash, and Masmano Joni. Uh, thank you so much, Tiana, for joining me today. Um, I greatly admire your work and your vision and I'm just thrilled to have the chance to speak with you on this occasion. Cool, very happy to talk to you today. So um, before we delve into talking about the work specifically, I wanted to start with a question um, which we're actually starting with for many of our talks related to grief and grievance, mm -hmm. which is about the uh, exhibition's curator, Okuyen Weser, um, who sadly passed away two years ago over the course of working on this show. Mm -hmm. um, and Tiana, I know that you met Okui, and I was wondering if you could talk a bit about that occasion when you first met. Yeah, um, Okui did a presentation here in Philly at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, I think it's like 2015 um, in their auditorium that uh, is no longer in existence. Their auditorium just got removed for a new wing. Um, 
And he was doing a presentation that featured the work of uh, Wangechi Mutu and um, Marlene Dumas in this interesting like juxtaposition. Um, and every like we were in there, I was in there with a group of black artists and we were just so spellbound <laughs> and also um, really like kind of shook that he was there, you know, uh, having read a little bit about what he's done and um, kind of admired him uh, for a little bit of time at that time. Uh, it's but still really not having a gravity of like how big this man really was. But when he was speaking, it just was like so apparent, you know, like the poetics, the way he delivered uh, the lecture was just so smooth, so cool, and so informative in a way that was um, very subjective. Like, you know, you could tell that he believed in what he was saying. And uh, afterwards, you know, got to go up and uh, shake his hand, and say thank you, and uh, walk with him a little bit outside of the museum, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was a very brief, very much like in gratitude, but um, very much impacted uh, me uh, for many years after that, because I, I admired, I still admire Oakley uh, because he is very non-traditional. He doesn't come from um, the traditional background uh, that you would think someone of his magnitude would, you know, being a poet kind of moving around in this like really odd way, something to identify with um, as someone who also kind of arrived in this space. So he has a, a big uh, part in the way and the confidence that I think I tried to develop by looking at him you know, to uh, get me to this point today. Awesome. Um, yeah, I um, yeah really admire that. I feel like in every introduction to your practice, there's like a string of things. <laughs> like you're an artist and a writer and a curator. And like, yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's um, yeah, it's really, I think, refreshing to hear about <laughs> like interdisciplinary practices like that because, you know, it, where people don't do just one thing. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's important. I mean, he's, He's one of, you know, the ones that lets you know that it's okay to like move around a bit. Um, and, but to do it in a way where you, you, you believe in it, you know, and I really like got that from him, you know, it wasn't for front, it wasn't a play. Uh, and also to acknowledge the gifts that people have coming from those different backgrounds. You know, I think I possess certain things that are definitely informed by the non-traditional means of how I got here, you know, um, for better or for worse but it makes it different. It makes it fun. It makes it not stale. <laughs> and, I, and I always was like, you know, he, he seemed almost like wizard-like with the fact that mm -hmm. he could cross so many things. And those are, those are skills that we all uh, need to be able to like get in and vibe with, you know, artists at various levels from mm -hmm. writing and curating and even making the work. So it's a big okay. deal. Yeah. Um, so we can start the slides. Um, and we'll start with the work that's included in uh, uh, in Grief and Grievance, and then kind of move through to like some subsequent projects and related works uh, following. Um, so here's an image of the work, The Full Severity of Compassion in the foreground, which is from the uh, installation in the lobby gallery in the show. Um, and I also included some following images with some details that I shot in the museum the other day. Um, because I feel that there's a real impact in seeing this work in person. Um, and hopefully these details can kind of help get a sense of these like arresting shadows and in the following slide, some like details in the textures um, from the like soft rope and the chrome pulleys and these like uh, expanses of like this matte black um, uh, paint uh, that's on the work itself. Um, and uh, then we can move through some images of the work as well, which is installed um, in your exhibition at Company Gallery in New York in 2019, uh, mm -hmm. which is called Hold On, Let Me Take the Safety Off. Um, so this work, The Full Severity of Compassion, is a fully functioning manual cattle squeeze shoot, um, and it's painted black. And for those of you who don't know, uh, I actually was unfamiliar with the cattle squeeze shoot myself, um, having grown up in New York City. <laughs> but the cattle squeeze shoot is used to hold cows um, and has this calming effect on them. And they're put in the device uh, as they're branded and inoculated and eventually slaughtered. Um, and I just wanted to begin, if you could talk a little bit about this, like how you came across this device and like what drew you to it to include it in this work. Um, and yeah, just basically how the idea for the work came into being. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this, yeah, this object has a, a particular um, place in my, you know, biography in relationship to where I'm from in, in the South. Um, and, you know, more so where I was born in like this kind of a rural Southern engagement in Blyville, Arkansas. But growing up in um, South Carolina and having access to uh, rural areas um, in Nimrod counties, this is a, something that I saw that I didn't know what it was for a very long time. Um, then I guess like to jump from like being a kid to like 2010, uh, Temple Grandin's um, fiction film uh, comes out with uh, Claire Danes playing uh, her and uh, features this cattle shoot um, in a particular way in relationship to her own autism and the way that it uh, impacted her uh, also during her farm <clears throat> assessments for like, you know, the work that she's known for. And uh, the reason that it was so impactful for me was because at the time I was like still very much, I guess in private around my diagnosis, which hadn't exactly been fully com confirmed um, so I was told that I would be or am on the autism spectrum disorder um, or on the spectrum is the way that they said it uh, back in like 2001 um, when I went in to kind of follow up on some counseling due to some teachers just checking and clocking this while I was in college at Clarkland University and um, I went and they said that they thought that I was on you know the spectrum and um, it took me a while to kind of go into a place to really look at that because at the time it was not a very it was, wasn't a lot of information available and it really kind of like shook me up to my core in a way that I, I couldn't deal with um so I kind of kept that in and I was recently diagnosed actually in 2019 uh, January after going um to be evaluated as an adult uh and I was like 37 at the time with being on the spectrum and so 2010 when this film comes out I see it and I am so completely floored by the connection of not only looking at a woman who's an adult and autistic, but also um, her relationship to this device that I had seen forever. <laughs> I really had no idea of what it was. And I mean, like, it's literally all around, even Greenville, we have a flea market that I grew up going to on White Horse Road, where we had um, uh, cattle for sale and you see this object there. And so um, to see the way that it was functioning within the, the film and the, the, the manual labor that it took to kind of make it go and close on these animals. Um, and then that moment of like complete and utter quiet and calm that was portrayed in this fiction film. But in the moment of that, that's not a fiction. The actual filming of that cow, that's a cow that's going through distress that's put in that. So I was really taken by that, um, you know, that juxtaposition of this fiction, but that moment not being a fiction. But then also the representation of um, uh, Grandin's character looking and seeking that calm and then eventually having a particular kind of overwhelming sensory um, situation that I also struggle with and running to that actual device to seek that pressure and having that same exact like moment of like relief. And so um, I always had that device as this particular kind of like object of desire you know, oddly, in my mind, um, and went about a different path of kind of seeking a similar relief, but actually on the other end of thinking about how I interact with leather, leather jackets, leather straps that I've worn underneath clothing to kind of provide a particular kind of sense, sensory uh, or sense feeling of being held together um, or being allowed to kind of stand on the ground. And when it came down to being able to do the show, I knew that I was gonna be making these like leather paintings that dealt with raw hide and um, putting them through this finishing process uh, that is similar to what a leather jacket appears or um, using techniques that boot blacks use to kind of keep shoes up, um, kind of like taking them out and bypassing a, a certain kind of structuring to the end game of it, restoring all these leather pieces and kind of presenting them as paintings. And so the cattle shoot as it's in its form sitting in the actual middle of the gallery um, kind of came in this in this moment where I decided that it was not it wasn't enough to allude to the actual device and that pressure and that complicated idea of feeling 
um, it, it needed the actual object uh, because I needed to see the object because the object was my psychological landscape for creating the work, but also like in my life, you know, um, and uh, being able to have the object there and have it fully functioning, um, you know, with the ropes that are also like you, those ropes move it, you know, um, in this kind of face off with those objects kind of hit the same notes of like bringing together these very complicated ideas of desire, relief, death, uh, you know, pleasure, um, all those things that I was interested in uh, while making this work and SM and kink and all those things because that space, SM kink for me has provided that very thing that this object also provides. The, yeah, I watched that scene from that film <laughs> prior to this. And I, I just wanted to mention, yeah, this was like real chaos, like with the cow, mm. like going crazy. And then like, they're like whipping it and getting it into this, into mm -hmm. this device. And then as soon as it clamps shut, there's this like romantic music and it comes like, oh, on the cow's face, on the cow's yeah. eyes. <laughs> mm. Yeah, no, I mean, they go, they go in in this weird, this weird way, but the thing, that I, you know, again, that was very interesting in the pushing up of the fiction and what I knew to not be fiction was that that was real. Yeah. It's fake for us with the music and, you know, uh, even the way, the way Claire Danes is at, in many ways looking at it, but it is very real for that cow. And so there's something that's still also the fiction of what the device actually provides, you know, mm -hmm. which is something I feel that a lot of people now can engage with is like, touch cows don't get hugged <laughs> you know a cow for the most part that's probably the first time it's ever felt that kind of a pressure what it provides is also a distraction and it's also very false it's something that is uh created to offset so that something else violent can happen right and i think that that was something that i was uh really interested in the the you know the fiction but also the reality um the non-fiction of the fact that temple Grandin also created a model that could actually fit her body because she desired that very same thing and also knew that it's temporary you know yeah. it's an illusion you know it's a it's it's false um it's real in its moment but it, it only lasts for so long and it's and it is a distraction you know right. from the reality of how you are you know as an autistic person who deals with sensory issues right or how something like that could be used for you know, good or violence yeah. or like very, it's like a very thin line, you know, like, yeah, yeah or like how, how things are used. Yeah. Um, I wanted to call attention to the label, like the extended label for the work, mm -hmm. uh, which is written by Maya Harakawa. And I just wanted to call attention to it because I feel like it's, well, first of all, it's great. <laughs> uh, and it's available on New Museum, uh, on newmuseum.tv that you can download all of the um, extended labels for the show actually. Um, and I bring up the text because I admire the openness to it in speaking about this work, which I think is really important. Um, and there is this particular line uh, which says, the physical sensations of pleasure and pain and the threat of imminent death complicate a straightforward reading of the sculpture, charging it with a multiplicity of possible interpretations. Um, and I just wanted to mention that because I feel like with this work, it can also like mean different things to different people. And like, I know I mentioned the textures of the work previously, and I feel like there's this really um, captivating like push and pull of like attraction and repulsion and lure and threat, uh, which uh, takes place here. And it's important that it's something that is multifaceted. Absolutely, you know, I mean, I you know, spoken with many people. I mean, one of the things I need to say here is that this work is absolutely not about slavery, you know, and I know that it kind of has been serving as this kind of um, Rorschachian device of, quite frankly, the white gaze in re relationship to, um, you know, black bodies or uh, black identity or black objects, but it, 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 it is not, um, it is explicitly not about that. I understand how you could arrive to it and understand that, um, you know, that it's in the shadow of a lot of things that could find its way there, which I support the conversation, but I think it's important that people, you know, kind of believe me when I say that this is <laughs> what it is about for me, um, despite what they feel, uh, you know, the, like, again, like the uh, rope that's used in here has nothing to do with lynching. <laughs> You know, it, it doesn't have anything to do with the um, way that it works uh, 
the rope is tied to a body in this device. There, it's a functionality device. Um, where rope does come in um, actually comes in this place that's very invisible in the actual work itself in regards to how it could tie to my own practice uh, with an SM or kink in rope bondage. It's still mimicking some of those same kind of desirous lines, the lines that you even see in um, the uh, way that it's installed in the gallery and the museum with the light. Um, I, I love that correlation. Um, it's something that I'm writing about now uh, to kind of like explode the project. Um, you know, this wall text that was provided for this particular show is the best wall text I've ever had. You know, so shout out to uh, uh, the writer because it, it actually um, did everything. You know, I felt like uh, all that was tied to the work was honored. You know, to be able to talk about my autism in this way, to be able to um, be very explicit about um, a certain kind of complicated idea around desire, but just the reality of what the device is. It's like, it's a hard thing to sum up. So, you know, I really love that. But I do think that it's it's an extraordinarily difficult work. It does push and pull at a lot of different things that I have been thinking about and I continue to think about that kind of really started to form in um, 2018 uh, in studio, actually, uh, while I was at Skowhegan for the summer. And it was when I was preparing for the, you know, the Whitney Biennial. I also had this particular corner of the studio dedicated to this weird object that caused me great distress because I needed to figure out how to um, deal with, uh, you know, abjection uh, um, and fetish and how, where I could find some kind of beauty in there. It's like, you know, abjection in the sense of like on the other side of that abjection is a fetish or is fetish and how to complicate those things. And I think that this device is kind of part of a, some works that are coming out of that, that thought process. So I do like to hear what people feel um, you know, uh, or if they are repulsed by it. There's times where I've been repulsed by it, uh, but, you know, it's very complicated, you know, read, which I'm open to figure out how it like kind of plays out over time. Yeah, totally. Um, and I think that kind of is a part of why it's such an amazing work is that it has that complicated read that um, will travel over time, um, I'm sure. Um, and actually, there was a there's an image I wanted to focus on, which was the when it's installed in uh, the show company uh, mm -hmm. with the chair. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I know that um, in grief and grievance, uh, it doesn't include the rest of the objects in the exhibition, yeah. including <laughs> the chair. <laughs> um, but uh, the reason, yeah, I just wanted to focus on it because um, I know that this pairing is significant for you. And um, the, yeah, the chair work uh, is titled sort of nice to not see you, but to feel you again. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I wanted to ask if you could elaborate a bit about this pairing of these, of these two works. Yeah, so when, um, you know, I conceived the show and installed the show and laid out the show for the company exhibition, um, it was uh, very apparent and made it very explicit on, you know, in the background that these works have to be like sold together. They were, they were always to be together. They're, they are a complete work. Um, the chair and the cattle shoot, um, you know, uh, were very much uh, tied to the actual narrative and action that I wanted to put in the space. And so that chair, that's a, you know, that's a Roar um, Wasili chair that I restored. It was originally brown, dusty, <laughs> like I had to go uh, retrieve this from a very, you know, uh, weird guy, like off the highway at Damir. Um, and, you know, all the objects really are, they never, they, that I got primarily were brown and sweated out leather, like really distressed, dirty stuff. And so, the process of trying to find this chair became very important to me because it is a chair that is one of the first definitive chairs that I kind of sit in. And I don't know if it's a, an, an exact chair because this is an original, um, but then there, it, it was a chair that I remember explicitly sitting in, in a therapy counseling appointment, uh, discussing you know a lot of the internal um, things that were happening to me. Uh, and I remember the, feeling of this chair and at one point feeling like if something wasn't together that it would collapse me you know or 
it, it, it just, there was something in my mind about like the fact that it, it was um, uh, almost alive in this way where the leather matched my body and all, you know, I could get hot, I could get cold. Um, and it was also this moment where it's immense, immense pressure uh, around preceding what I was actually about to talk, say out of my mouth around like feeling very different, feeling like, you know, overwhelmed in my body, like my body buzzing, I remember saying. And what it meant to say that was this almost like, you know, feeling of like letting something seep out like air. And so the chair, when I was working on the chair, it was very, you know, it, I think I took on the task of figuring out how do I make this chair mine? And in in, even though it's, it is mine, right? It is not my design uh, it, as this like, you know, uh, ready-made, how does it then become mine in relationship to what is going on in my head? And um, this, despite taking it to just the basic process of uh, boot blacking and shining it with like, you know, the, the best shoe polish in the world, um, I stuck the razor blade in there because I needed that to be this representation of that exact feeling. And there's like razor blades that I put um, throughout the gallery as well to kind of like allow that seeping feeling to happen throughout the gallery for me. Like, I don't even know if a lot of people saw that, but with the chair explicitly that needed to be there. It also needed to suggest that that chair would never be sat on. Like that, that chair was mine. I'm the last person to sit on it. Uh, that feeling needs to stay there. I, but no one else needs to occupy that as a chair because it's more of a psychological uh, device. Um, it also has functionality to me uh, in terms of its design that's very similar to the cattle shoe. It's really a, a, a beautiful object that deals to me with ideas around restraint. Um, I love the lines. They're similar to the lines that I desire. They're the lines literally in the, in the artist statement around how I read lines in rooms. Um, and it, it casts the same uh, kind of like perfect geometry in shadows. Uh, so it was this, this, this correlation of then, you know, me and this device that deals with animals, again, seeking to try to find a, a perfect harmony and uh, face off of human, black me, <laughs> black woman, me, person, uh, and this device that is for animals, but also still having this conversation about this desire to be like kind of held, you know. I, there's a, some more images of the razor blade, like a detail, I think next in the next image and then some images of it on the walls. And I, we were like talking about this previously and I, I feel like there's this counter happening with the razor blade and the cattle shoot too, that's quite interesting. Like when I look at the razor blade, like it's like this piercing quickness or sharpness. Um, yeah. And it's like, it, and in relationship also to that chair and to the cattle and to the cat, cattle squeeze shoot, like that feeling of like this slow, like heavy pressure. Um, and yeah, I, I, um, I also wanted to ask about those razor blades in the walls. I think the next image is the razor blade in the wall. Um, and, and also this, the title of them and wh what that means. Yeah, they're razor blades. Um, this, is a, this is a little weird background on it, but there are people who are into only purchasing razor blades that are made in the USA. Uh, in this like weird puritanical, weird, like I, I like razor blades when you go by them, uh, there are people who explicitly denote that they are made in America or made in the USA. Um, and there's a stamp you know, this like indention or branding that happens to that um, to say where it's made. Uh, and I was really interested in uh, just all that history of like this, you want this definitive like <laughs> kind of like weird object uh, that is sold in like tins or people will sell one depending on the air like, when it's made. Um, and so, when I was looking at them, I've always had them in the studio. The way, if anybody's <laughs> in my studio, I use them like you use tacks. So like they hold up my papers. Um, I use them instead of scissors. Uh, and um, I've always been uh, interested in the, the way that you have to be gentle to kind of almost be surgical in your position, pre precision of cutting. Um, I also understand them as this like tool that has uh, that I've used also to like cut myself like in um, 
uh, uh, the Brad Johnson project, I actually read a poem while like cutting my forehead with it because it's like precise and it's the same kind of um, kind of feeling that I wanted with the chair uh, to see if I can like kind of rhyme the feeling. But um, as someone who's not a cutter, right, and aware of people who uh, use it to cut, I found that psychologically it's the same kind of search for relief that I felt that it could represent when punctured in these different spaces. So it's almost like a language tool for me. Um, it could very well be written, but it like read like with it on the screen now, I read it and I understand the feeling in me, you know, what it what it feels like. So I have them as objects um, that uh, are able or available for sale. Like, um, and it's a limited edition of 100. So it's like MIA one, two, three. I have like one in my uh, 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 apartment right now. Hmm. Cool. Um, I, yeah, it's interesting. I didn't know that Made in America, that that was like a stamp. And then uh, in the following images, we have uh, Bruiser and uh, an image, which is the, um, uh, yeah, the leather, the leather painting. Um, and then there's also a leather jacket painting after this. Um, and, uh, I, and also I noticed that the shoe polish brands are often the titles or they're like yeah given that importance and somehow that for me was like relating to when you were saying that like label of made in America too that like those labels that stick out um but I yeah I wanted to ask a bit about these works um and also the process of creating them mm -hmm. um and the materials that are included in them which I included here in these slides because um I feel like they're significant you know the specific shoe polish as well as spit and um, and yeah, just if you could talk a bit about how they're produced and um, how you see them kind of in relationship to the works in the installation. Yeah. Um, Sapphire is the fine, uh, your Sapphire uh, is finest shoe polish <laughs> in the world, um, you know, uh, that I could get my hands on. Um, and, uh, you know, the core of how I decided to approach. Um, the idea of doing leather paintings had everything to do with the shine, right? Like black is the color, the dye that's underneath. And with Bruiser is something very special. If we can stay on this slide for a minute, I'll talk specifically about this one because it's very unique in the larger series because it's the only one that I actually um, bring in um, a blue and a red undertone uh, underneath the black. Uh, but when I was approaching this, I was like, I'm gonna do paintings and they're all gonna be uh, shoe polish and the technique would be very much uh, the technique of shoe shiners and boot blacks. So bringing together, you know, uh, this act that's of service that is a, also a labor. This is something that people go get, you know, something that I've gotten, but then also, you know, boot blacking as a desirous um, positionality of various members within the, uh, you know, SM community, kink community. Uh, and I wanted to kind of like, kind of tap on like or, or approach how they both sit next to each other and um, put myself at service to the paintings. Like, so it was just an extraordinarily aggressive handling of this hide, um, this raw hide uh, that again is not unformed that I have to like take through this extraordinarily detailed process. Um, and then the focus is that I would have to figure out uh, different techniques to develop different shines that would deliver particular pet uh, patterns that um, would grow over time, um, but also dealt with stark light. So the way that the painting uh, would be read is actually by the gesture that is used by a shoe shining to read whether or not a shoe is shining well when they actually paint. And the reason that they move like that has to deal with the fact that you're moving with leather Leather is not just static. So it was this interesting moment of like, I knew these, these things would be static on the wall, but I still need to figure out how to give that shine. So uh, most times I told people if they went to see the work, you, the best way to see the work is actually to rock and kind of get yourself in that gesture. Um, but it's very laborious work. I mean, I turned my work in uh, for the biennial, the Whitney biennial, like in uh, April. And I was like boot blacking every day, which was its own kind of <laughs> mental, uh, space of like this immense service, this immense care, having to be very mindful of what the leather does, things that have to happen in certain times. Um, if you go to the next slide with the uh, Saphir piece, yeah, 
the jackets, and there's two, um, Kelly's Diamonds and Sapphire, and they're both named after uh, the, the shoe polish that I use. Um, and again, these are jackets that arrived to me very worn. Um, and this is where I wanted to bring in a particular tie to um, the Black SM community that I've uh, been a part of specifically in relationship to the elders. You know, there's people who in, interact in these um, relationships, uh, you know, with uh, uh, play partners. And over many years, if that person passes away, they retain the leather. They, they retain the leather. And there's many times that I've gone in people's houses and these jackets, these boots are set up in these like beautiful like presentations um, that are almost like altar-like uh, on walls, um, in their bedrooms or in their own room or in playrooms. And it's there to give an homage to the person who they engaged with in this particular kind of like SM engagement. Um, and also tends to be um, uh, submissive folks who, who want to pay honor to a dominant figure. And the whole desirous point is memory tied to this idea of pleasure and, and play. And the form of the jackets were always very interesting to me because some of them, they're not just hung on the wall like how you hang, they're actually put out to suggest the body's still there. And so I wanted to take these beautiful uh, jackets, leather jackets that were also like worn in of the time of my um, years, like 80s and apply the same kind of techniques and kind of put them and approach them as paintings and uh, do these different kind of shines that uh, show up at different points. Um, so even though they kind of, you know, they're kind of hard to read uh, through picture, in person there's different moments of how the leather shines that gives this kind of like movement uh, there. And the spit, you know, <laughs> I guess the materials, uh, the sapphire shoe polish spit in many cases, um, you know, sometimes there's water there, but again, using those same techniques that I, I, I've seen used by shoe shiners and, you know, uh, boot blocks, you know, and it does require like spit and spit. That's how you get your shine. They yeah. pull it up. Totally. Um, that uh, the next work is actually uh, called Polisher. Um, and yeah, I think it's really interesting that you're like addressing that process or like the performative qualities of these works and mm -hmm. also how like in viewing them, you can kind of see a part of that process. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, there's something I think also, I mean, with the contrast um, that, you know, I was mentioning before with the materials. Yeah, like what you can't experience through these images of like seeing those those different textures and especially mm -hmm. like in this space of the gallery, like there was this kind of like really bright white um, <laughs> like walls that were like piercing almost um, and against these like kind of light absorbing works. Um, and yeah, I wanted to ask a bit about the this piece and like how it was was it used in this process uh for the other works and your decision to to include it absolutely um and it's like polisher and i have another polisher <laughs> that i had to use when i was repairing the works but um polisher event it, it immediately i think like after like two weeks showed itself that it, this is going to be a piece and and the reason why is because it was a way that i was able to assess time um the technique of polishing that I used dealt with what I saw um, from one of the best, one of the best shoe shines I've ever gotten in my life uh, was in um, Union, Union Station in DC. Um, and this cat uh, cut t-shirts. And this is like common, I've seen this. Some people use these like micro um, fabrics, but this cat used to just cut, used to cut t-shirts from the bottom up from these like rings, wrap the hands almost like a boxer and go to work with the water, the, you know, any alcohol, if you needed to pull something out and then the polish and it just like, you take it wrap, round, wrap, round, keep going, keep going. And um, I did the same technique. And so it was something that makes sure it turns your hand, hand into like something like this uh, and it turns it into like the actual, like I guess the brush or whatever. Um, but it allows you to still feel like if something is too wet or if it's, you know, too dry in this way that I really love. And so um, this polisher, uh, you know, 2019 um, was used to make all of the work in the entire show. It also retains this, uh, the smell um, and the remnants of, of course, the colors that I talked about, the, the blue and the red that you probably wouldn't be able to see. Um, but I loved it as a, a device that let me see time 
because I was in such a place of like, it, it, it's very repetitive, but I could look over and see Polisher and I could look over and see my shirts and I could tell that there was time passing <laughs> in a way that was really, really lovely. That um, again, was a different kind of language uh, that was really important to, this, the, to my um, studio at the time, but I thought would be very important in the show itself. Mm, totally, it's like the clock. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then uh, before we move on to some other projects, I wanted to bring up the press release and this poem um, that was the press release for the show by Mia Kang. Um, and yeah, just to ask a bit about it, was it um, a commission um, or yeah, how did the, the text come about? Yeah, uh, Mia, it's Mia Kang um, is my fiance now. <laughs> um, and an amazing poet, uh, and, you know, company has always been cool in the sense that they approach um, press releases very in a non-traditional way. The press release has the opportunity for the artist to be whatever form uh, you, you want it to take. And in my case, I wanted my press release to be this poem. Um, Mia actually came uh, to Philly and did a studio visit uh, with me. Um, and I asked her, you know, to do this, uh, you know, she knew about the work and everything. But I was like, I want you to come to the studio, sit with me. And, you know, part of the practice at that time is that anybody who visited me during that time, if they had on leather shoes, I would boot black their shoes. So part of the process with me and her was that I actually cared for her shoes to show her the process. I also knew that, um, you know, aside from, um, you know, being an amazing art historian, uh, a poet um, that Mia had a, a, a background as a ballerina as well. And so there's a lot of conversations about that uh, particular kind of engagement um, around like pain and performance, but also this feeling that was consistent within the work around suspension of disbelief um, or ideas of suspension or this kind of like floating feeling uh, that I wanted to touch on various levels. And so this is what she came up from the studio visit. I told her the title of the show is going to be hold on let me take the safety off um i talked basically around a, a couple of the things that um connected us is uh as well tied to the belts that are featured the lineman harnesses that are featured in there um that are kind of this uh you know subtle homage to the photographer alvin baltrop uh mia worked on the alvin baltrop show that was um at um is it queens or bronx bronx museum um and uh did archival, you know, work and wrote a gorgeous essay for that, um, you know, show. So I already knew that she could get in with me and know, like, th this is what I'm doing here when I'm thinking about these harnesses on the wall and the fact that they're suspending these folks and leather is the choice because it actually is the thing that, you know, insinuates like a certain kind of human strength that gives false sensitivity or security, but also real security, security from falling. And um, yeah, she came in and I love of what she went in with, especially around the ideas of the, you know, Balan, that's how you say it, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> the jump in that moment of like what I would, I would see, you know, you jump, but it seems like some kinds, like basketball players, they go to dunk and it's like, you know, Michael Jordan, LeBron, they feel like they're hovering for a moment. That feeling is exactly the feeling that I was kind of trying to keep myself in um, across various ways of practice. Even the boot blacking was me trying to work myself up in a bit of a subspace, you know what I mean? This like fluttering, like float of like euphoria almost, you know? Um, so yeah, yeah, this is, this is, this is what she produced and this is what opened the show. Awesome. Um, and yeah, speaking of that, uh, like that feeling, um, I, uh, and also the amount of work that you were producing at this time, I wanted to uh, bring up the piece from the Whitney, uh, which is called, I prayed to the wrong God for you, um, which was, uh, yeah, included in the Whitney Biennial in 2019. And yeah, an amazing work. Uh, and in, you won the Buxbaum prize uh, for, for this work in the show. Um, and I'm curious to hear a bit about what it was like to create this work, um, I think almost simultaneously, mm -hmm. right? To the, to the work that we were just showing mm -hmm. um, and perhaps the differences between the projects as well as how they might connect. Yeah, 
uh, whew, I pray to the wrong God. I mean, I think this is one of the, you know, ways to talk about service. You know, um, I think I was in a very submissive, you know, state as a more like dominant type uh, person with the work. I just decided to kind of be served in a very different way um, that I had, hadn't done in a very long time. And so like, um, I pray to the wrong God for you was uh, very much, it, it was happening in studio at the same time as some of the earlier parts of, uh, hold on, let me take the tape out. Um, and uh, even down to like, literally when I was like at Scott, he can trying to figure out like, what the hell is this year gonna be that about for me? Because it was just so much um, work. The way that I decided to approach this, uh, you know, um, body of work, um, which has everything to do with me challenging my ideas around uh, the spiritual directives and works that come up in my like readings as a priestess uh, tied to the work that I do, which is like this art making. And what was coming up at the time had a lot to do with the, my, the, the way that I am in terms of like this kind of play the back or um, my uh, confidence or courage needed to be challenged. I need to improve. I need to be more forthcoming and more declarative in this way. This is what was coming up that was something that I need to attend to in, in regards to my evil Pele and my character. And, um, you know, at the time, uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a child of Ogun. <clears throat> Ogun has my head. Uh, and there was a lot of Shango talk. <laughs> and I was like, what's going on here? Because Shango and Ogun have a pretty raw, you know, relationship. It's not exactly always the same. Shango's more in the front, Ogun's more in the back. That's like the simplest way I can explain it. And so to be told that I need to do work with Shango was very much like, uh, you know, overwhelming for me because I'm like, I don't know how to do that. Like front, 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 uh, kind of like, you know, chest, chest out all the time thing. Um, but with the work, I decided to follow the lead of like the rituals and the things that uh, 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 are very much tied to very much what I felt like I wanted to do to pay honor, but also what I needed to do in a basic sense to create the tools of the God. Um, and so the process is like, you know, it's it's this, it was a year of me, um, you know, kind of producing a work that led me from um, the states in various different uh, uh, states and cities, but also took me to uh, Cuba and also, um, you know, took me to um, Nigeria and Ibadan uh, to one of the original and uh, oldest uh, shrines to Shango, uh, where those objects are actually were, you know, there's objects that were taken and are at um, D DIA in Detroit. Um, so it has a lot of, it, it, it's, it was this very much, for me, extraordinarily complicated, but to me also nuanced conversation about ideas around repatriation, um, but thinking a little bit more into thinking about there's repatriation, but also like ideas of repatriation tied to um, my own spiritual practice, but also my physical self. How could I move my body through the diaspora? Because actually, you know, at that time, there are a lot of things that I am that can create alarm in various places. And, you know, so for me to go and forcibly, you know, like push myself to say, I'm going to travel to Nigeria by myself. I didn't even tell anybody. It wasn't really the best thing to do, to go to Havana where I have my family, my spiritual family there. Um, and to also do this work in the state where things are very different and we don't have all the tools, but what are the tools that I have? Mm -hmm. The tools that I had were the wood. I could find the tree that is made of, you know, uh, these uh, tools. I can actually create these things for the God here. And so it had a lot to do with a confrontational moment that I wanted um, in relationship to myself, not only in the show, because I was very, very keen on like what it would mean for me to say, this is where I stand here but also I have this confrontational moment with American history in regards to this like 400 year anniversary, um, you know, where I'm saying that this is who I am. This is what I retain as a legacy as my ancestors retain this for me to get. Um, this is what I did to be able to bring this uh, into the space here and this show about America, you know, as a black, uh, you know, woman. Um, so yeah, it's tied together in that sense of like service it's one that was very much about service and very quiet. It's probably the more, both of those works are the more private works I've ever done so far. Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, and also like with, like even like with bringing spirituality forward in this, yeah. like that's, yeah, it's really, um, 
I think you had like a quote that was up on the screen when you did the Bucks Bound about how it was like the thing the art world fears most. Yes. Um, yeah. So it's also, yeah, kind of putting yourself out there and like you're, yeah, um, in a way that's like not necessarily embraced in, in this in this field for sure. Um, and when we were discussing the uh, full severity of compassion, uh, you brought up the Brad Johnson tape um, as uh, kind of relating to it. And um, to kind of go back to two years before you made this work. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, I just wanted to start if we could briefly, you know, touch upon how you came to know the work of uh, the late poet and writer Brett Johnson um, and how it led to this project. Yeah, um, you know, Brad Johnson is like, comes whew, in the, like the trilogy works that I, I, I consider them a trilogy or a triptych even. Uh, the three, um, you know, black gay men who were producing work at the height of the AIDS, AIDS epidemic, you know, um, I did work for uh, Essex Hemphill, um, it's an online piece, and I did, I curated the retrospective for Julius Eastman um, that was in Philly as well as New York in the kitchen. And uh, with Brad Johnson, um, that was a piece that uh, premiered at, at Philadelphia um, uh, Institute of Contemporary Art in a show called Speech Acts, curated by uh, Meg only. Um, and, you know, the Brad, well, Brad Johnson is, it's so important to talk a little bit just about how he comes to me, but also like how core he is to the work that's in the new museum without his language and without um, his particular kind of guidance, I wouldn't have had the courage to even get to that point. And this is like just across the board. Like I wouldn't have the courage to even um, talk about, uh, you know, my autism, talk about these desires around SM and kink there's just a lot of that came up when I um, came about his work. And again, he's someone who existed in plain sight. He's someone whose work I had read and I did not know who he was until there, there was a particular kind of representation of the work tied to um, him writing uh, a review for Essex and Phil's first chapbook, Earth Life. And, I was, I, and it, it was a big moment for me because I was doing this work on Essex and Phil and these figures are all these particular, these figures that I consider um, to be uh, what I consider like, like obscure, you know, in many ways. Um, there's, there's people within the community who know them very well, but there's something where at that moment, uh, I felt like they, they were getting lost in the shuffle of this representation of these like figures within um, HIV and AIDS, uh, you know, art, you know, presentations that were dominating um, New York and elsewhere uh, around like 2017, 2018. And so like Brad is this poet, he's placed the back, he's, uh, you know, um, grew, you know, grew up here in Philly. Um, we shared a, a PO box that was close to each other. You know, it was just this bizarre moment in reading his work, but he had explicit, beautiful work in his archive uh, when I went to see it at uh, Schomburg um, uh, Center for, uh, you know, Research Black, Black Culture um, in the In the Life archive. Uh, when I went to see that, I realized that he was somebody that I needed to see because of his connection to a, a friend of mine, Stephen Forward, um, as well as to another um, uh, person uh, who I did a lot of work with back in the day, Lisa uh, Seymour, um, in regards to this like person who was on the periphery. And so I was focusing on these dominant figures with this like prolific body of work, Eastman um, and uh, Hemphill. Here's Brad Johnson. To me, just as prolific, but it's just moving different. And um, as he's particularly interesting because his work is not known because a lot of the people who published his uh, uh, poetry, they also died of uh, AIDS um, complications. And I was just like kind of blown away about how he was like easily kind of like pulled out of this larger conversation. And so basically, the Brad Johnson tape is a 90 minute tape. The tape is an object, but it also contains uh, documentation of me in my studio over the month of August in 2017, where I take uh, pieces of Brad Johnson's archive and I take, and then I have, have engage in these um, self dominated scenes or self engaged scenes or play by self uh, that are tied to SM acts. Because the work that I'm reading is him being very explicit 
about his SM or desires that are kink related. And I'm trying to match and kind of find a harmony of the sensation that I felt from reading it to the sensation that I can arrive. And I'm looking for this moment of complete harmony or, you know, it, what I'm processing his work through is the concept of Zuissant. He was someone who also studied uh, French literature and, uh, you know, psychoanalysis and all that stuff. Um, and I'm looking for my moment. I'm looking for this moment that's both a split of the self, but also this moment where these things crash into each other and it's just complete, like, pleasure and, like, you know. Um, and so the tape, no one knows, except for me, I, I use it as, like, kind of a text. And that language that comes from that tape of looking at myself in those different acts are what has like produced like the work in the leather paintings because there's things that come up in that medium. VHS tape delivers a certain kind of aesthetic and a read of the black body uh, in sweat and in its like structure um, and figure. Um, and I'm reading myself. I'm reading myself um, as figure and I'm reading myself in motion to develop new language and to develop new work. So it's kind of like the, the short end of it is that it was my way to get towards abstraction because I didn't really trust myself as someone who's very much interested in figurative work um, to just jump to abstraction without a certain kind of ordeal or an ordeal path to then go to a place where I'm like, I understand the places where language and figure, they, they, they fail me. So now I understand where I can do these things that are more abstract and believe in me. Totally. Um, no, that's so interesting to hear you talk about it related to that, to abstraction. The next image is the installation that was at the Speech Act show uh, at the IC in Philadelphia. Um, yeah. and I was in the collection of MoMA, which is exciting. Um, yeah. And yeah, so did the objects, I think there's like, how many, is 60 objects that it's are- It's almost 70. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I had to do the registrar work for this, for this acquisition. So that's the only reason I'm like, it's almost, it's like 68. <laughs> uh, yeah, and this is, this is X on subjugation, so that's just one. It's the one uh, that is also of a public text. It's a text that's been published, so that's why people are able to see it, um, where I actually read on subjugation uh, while suspended by my feet on the very structure itself that it's being represented on. Yeah. Okay, cool. So that's the video in the middle. Yeah, and and the, that whole space is a recreation of the studio that I was in for that entire month. And are those objects ones that you used in the video? Yeah. Every single thing, the shirt has my sweat on it. There's like the razor blade that I cut myself still has my blood on it. Um, you know, the work on the corner there is the first presentation of Seite Subiru Santo, the, the photo series that, you know, incurred some censoring stuff that I put and abandoned in the studio. Everything had a particular kind of functionality, but it's also how I, I set up like language uh, modes for myself in the studio. I have a lot of objects that I kind of read in a certain way that enter into the, a final project. And so Meg, through immense grace, let me come in and kind of have, you know, what I could say, my Tracy Ehrman moment, you know, where I was like able to just take from the studio and put right into the, um, you know, uh, museum. And so, um, yeah, you know, to have that piece acquired by moment is like crazy because it's like probably a more fragile mm -hmm. work. Um, and it's uh, so, so such a difficult, work that is also process-based um and yeah and I also I mean you know I don't you know uh, the work uh that we've been talking about I that work was required acquired by, by um Bob Rennie he bought the entire show of uh hold on hold on let me take the safety off so I got two really difficult rooms that are held together uh for my life you know work <laughs> to kind of talk about something that's so hard to talk about or make sense of you know yeah. Oh, that's so important that they're all together. Yeah. Amazing. Um, and because of, I realize like we're at an hour, um, but I have one more question. I, actually, I think we have, yeah, I wanted to ask about, oh, this is the labyrinth, which is also included in the, in the, um, uh, yeah, the uh, installation we saw previously. Mm -hmm. um, but then my last question, I, and I have actually so many more questions, but I'll, I'll end on, on, I don't want, I don't want to forget talking about uh, conceptual shade. Um, yeah. It's very important, yeah, um, to do so. And uh, if anybody has any questions, we can take like, a, like a few questions after this. Um, so you can go ahead and put them in the Q&A. Um, and uh, yeah, I wanted to make sure that we talked about your space, uh, which is in Philadelphia, conceptual shade, um, which you opened 
happened this past February uh, of this year. Um, and uh, yeah, I know you have exhibitions in the space, your library is there and available for public use. Um, yeah, and I wanted to just ask a bit about how the, sp the space, how it started, how it's going. Yeah, no, space is just coming up, um, you know, this past year of uh, being in the pandemic and, you know, uh, kind of forcibly having to delay a lot of things that are coming about this year. Um, put me, I've decided to take the level of fear <laughs> that I think a lot of us are dealing with and reevaluate things on my list that um, I felt uh, I was afraid of. And a lot of them um, had ties to do with different kinds of works. Uh, and one of them on the list was literally conceptual fate. Conceptual fate is an idea that I had for almost five years, um, had ownership of the domain name for five years, uh, but didn't, I kept saying, oh, I'm not ready to do it. I'm not ready to do it. The short of it is just, it's, it's basically me allowing my personal library that I've been collecting since I was a kid uh, to be open to the public. Um, my library centers uh, Black thought, Black artists, design, you know, monographs are something that, you know, I've like tried to acquire over the years, these last couple of years, really. And, um, you know, wanting to make that open to the public so that they can see, quite frankly, wh where do I get ideas from? Uh, but then also in this time, uh, I was thinking about access to uh, libraries and, and, and spaces where you don't have to buy something. Um, and so it's a space where there's no like exchange of money. Um, and it also references uh, two different things, you know, um, there's a place called the Pyramid Club, institution rather, called the Pyramid Club that uh, functioned as this like kind of fraternal, um, you know, cultural society for black individuals from the 1930s up until like 1960s here in Philly, in North Philly specifically, where um, black families gathered and also hosted art shows uh, in the, you know, 40s and 50s um, to support and patron black artists. And I was very moved by that. And I always wanted to do something that uh, would honor that. And then, uh, time that I spent in Tokyo, brief time, a couple of weeks uh, spent in Tokyo um, in Japan, uh, frequenting jazz bars. I'm a huge fan of uh, jazz and um, really being taken by those bars, as well as a specific bar in uh, uh, Shinjuku and Chome that was tied to uh, Black L like LGBT publications um, and the way that they were presented by the um, owner, uh, Toa Gore, was very, very uh, moving to me. Um, and uh, I really, um, you know, wanted to deal with something that was also small. And so my new studio had a small space built in. I renovated it a bit and opened in February. And um, it features uh, shows that are run like every two months, uh, only showing one single work uh, that then is supported by uh, materials that show like the process, the thinking process behind them. And I curate from the library and I pull books that people could think about in conversation with that work. Um, and the first show was in honor of my late friend, Jimmy Merritt, who was one of the um, jazz messengers uh, with Art Blakey's uh, band. He passed away last April, April, April 10th. So the first show featured his um, bass, the bass, the last acoustic bass that he had for almost 50 years, traveled the world with. Awesome. Um, and uh, no, I think uh, the space is, is, yeah, it's, it's amazing. And it's, I think it's, um, it's really powerful that kind of during this like uncertain time of like reimagining institutional models too, that like artists like yourself are creating these spaces that really build care into them um, and kind of expand these definitions of what these spaces for art could be like. Um, and I saw one question came in, um, which was from uh, Warren Critchlow, um, where uh, <laughs> he uh, came to know your work as the curator of the Julius Eastman retrospective and wanted to know if you could discuss the relationship between your work, vision, method as a curator and your aesthetic vision, vocabulary as an artist, which came first, curating or art making, or has your practice evolved back and forth between the two? Yeah, so curatorial practice for me, the short of it is that it's the place where I, you know, I, I curate what I can't do, <laughs> but I have immense respect and uh, desire to see, and I'm not interested in, you know, there's certain things like I, I'll push myself to do stuff that's in, in quite frankly, I, like I follow the idea, meaning that I don't limit myself to what I can do, you know, in most ways, but I do limit myself sometimes by what I um, am able to learn physically in amount of time. And there's a lot of amazing artists that do things that I'm so interested in and I believe in, 
uh, and I want to see them, you know? So it's like curating for me is also like writing, you know, for those who can write in that really great way. Uh, so I want to produce the things that I want to see. Um, and so I tend to try to not do things that I haven't seen. Um, and uh, it's a way for me to support still the idea without trying to do it. Because I, I feel like there are, again, people who do things so well that I'll never be able to do. And I, I, I want to see it uh, presented um, very well. Um, and Warren, I met, you know, for the Eastman show, this perfect example, um, a very hard example, because I don't suggest anybody's first show be a uh, retrospective, <laughs> a traveling retrospective uh, that takes four years of your life. But I needed to dedicate that time to Eastman because I felt like he was a reference that I didn't have the chance to have. I feel like I could have cut years off of like the struggle of a lot of the things I was trying to do if I knew about a, a, a Julius Eastman. And, um, you know, I felt like if that's how I feel, maybe this is how other people will feel. Um, and, you know, with Eastman, he, you know, gave me permission in many ways to be very wild and be very, very like, stand on the ledge for the things that you kind of believe in. Um, and it's like, you know, once you handle the materials that I know that I got to handle, not all of them that made it to the public, there's no, there's no plain it like, you know, square as you say. It's just like, you can do beautiful things within these weird forms that are just so brutal and so like rigorous and beautiful. And so he was very big for me. I, I, I needed to get that. I needed to see that. And I also need to understand the fragility and the burnout. I need to understand failures in a different, you know, a different kind of a way. Um, and again, uh, you know, with all those guys, especially with Eastman, it was, I wanted to answer the work with his own work. Like, you know, like put forth something within, um, but also put him in conversation with uh, these younger artists who I felt like uh, were doing some of the many things that he did. And it, so I go in between that, you know, um, but I do, I do, I can't admit because I have been asked that, I do have a curatorial mind when I make my work but it doesn't come in. I don't let it come in until I've finished. So I don't think of space in the way that I think a lot of folks may think about things. I'll just make it and it may not even fit <laughs> somewhere, but then I just have to get it together. I'm like, you gotta chop. Like, so I'm a hard editor, you know? Well, that's the, the only question. So cool. yeah, thank you so much, Tiana. This is awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, yeah. take care. Have a good rest of your day. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. Thank you. It was nice to talk about this work in this way. And I hope that um, it's giving people a bit more insight on the ways that I think about these things.